G'day, g'day, and welcome to Tartarian Truthers with your host Casey and Jojo. G'day, Jojo. G'day, mate. <laughs> it's been a minute, hasn't it? Oh, gosh, it sure has. It has. This is our first episode for 2023. Yep, that's right, Casey. Our last episode was so epic. It was a two-parter where we looked at Australia's interesting connections to Antarctica and how that pertains to the possibility of a flat earth theory. And we actually got some fantastic feedback, didn't we? Yeah, we sure did. We have such an amazing community of beautiful and supportive, open-minded folk willing to look down new rabbit holes And we also have quite a few experienced campaigners who had already been looking into that theory for some time. Mm -hmm. That's right. And what was really cool too is we received some emails and check these out. So on the left here from Solar Function, um, it's actually, uh, she found this map Um, that was found apparently hanging in the UN office and it shows that Earth appears to be much bigger than what we're told and it kind of supports the flat Earth theory, doesn't it? Yeah, wow. That's incredible. What a find. Mm, Need to do a bit more research on that one. Definitely. That's insane. Um, Yeah, then this image from, uh, sorry, this image on the right from Eva showing us the grand circle which depicts some major landmarks on a flat earth and they all fall on this line of latitude and you can see the names of the sites on the bottom of the image. Yeah very interesting indeed and you know it makes you wonder like what falls in the southern parts I'm just curious, you know, that there possibly could be some other major landmarks that align perfectly with Uluru, for example. Oh, yeah, for sure. I don't doubt that at all. Uh, All right. And then we've also got this video um, from Eva. Thank you. So she managed to get inside of Darling Park in Sydney during a recent visit and walked around the perimeter of that fountain that we mentioned uh, in our last episode, Jojo. Hi guys. So people said you can't find a flat earth. Well, guess what? I did. Back to Australia. Here it is in Sydney, Darling Park. See ya. How awesome is that? And thank you both so much for sharing um, videos and pictures. We love getting stuff um, on the email, so thank you so much. But before we move on to the episode, we must mention that lots of love was shown to our mate Darcy as well. Um, A few people wanted to know how to get the Flat Earth app um, that that Darcy had actually talked about in that second episode. Right, so here are the details. So you can get it on either the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. Um, just be sure to use the code DCLF5D. So, Casey, what's in store for us today? So today is a very special day because we're collaborating with our dear friend, Tom. Yes, Tom. So awesome. Casey, I have been so excited about this episode. And when Tom did reach out to us, I think it was late last year, to see if he could share his theories with us on Tartarian Truthers, I was absolutely floored because Tom is seasoned in so many topics and subjects. And he's been researching and searching for the truth like us for most of his life. 
And I knew whatever he had to bring to the table was going to be big. Absolutely huge. So <laughs> listen to this. Tom is a spatial scientist, a registered surveyor and natural disaster asset coordinator. He has been called as an expert witness in the Supreme Court on matters of construction precision, historic land use, and has worked on multiple archaeological and historic asset management surveys. He has modelled and investigated pyramids, temples and ruins in Cuba, Mexico, Guatemala, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, China, Indonesia, Hungary, Croatia, Montenegro, Czech Republic, Estonia, Norway and Finland. He has presented at spatial conferences on mysteries surrounding historic map cartographic precision and ancient sea maps correlations with astrotheology and mythology. And as a hobby, he has investigated the logistics and technology of place to scene construction and utilizes his access to aerial data sets to make discoveries of megalithic sites and the remnants of lost or incorrectly categorized civilizations. Wow. Wow. And that's all, Casey? Yeah, that's-, <laughs> that's all. How unbelievably remarkable is that? What a repertoire. Mm. So I wasn't sure what a spatial scientist was, so I looked it up, of course, and if you all want to have a little read, there it is. It's a pretty cool job. Um, but, um, yeah, just yeah. unbelievable. Amazing. So Tom has dedicated pretty much his entire life to this research and today he's going to present his theory to us and everyone watching of Tartaria and the construction of the three worlds. Welcome, Tom. Thanks, Tim. What a fantastic intro. Thanks so much for having me. Welcome. You're welcome. It is so good to have you here. Now, your research is extensive and thorough and you've travelled all over our realm and your findings are absolutely remarkable. Let's get into it. Fantastic. Okay, well, the the main point that I wanted to kind of make out of this presentation was the idea of a much longer time frame of civilizations than what's currently recognised. And very often this will pop up uh, in the archaeological records. So I thought I'd just go through and explain it a bit because Tartaria, uh, I have a kind of an etymological definition that is a remnant of an, a more ancient uh, civilization. And they were uh, truly global in the, the idea that many of the um, mythological links and the scientific links and the um, constellation on the astro theology, they're all linked together by a group of people who had traveled uh, and spread this information. And the remnant of that is Tartaria, those that could remember. Uh, so what I want to do is just get into how you can assess the age of construction, largely, uh, sorry, the age of the civilization by the construction methodology. And the does that kind of make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that sounds interesting. <laughs> awesome. Um, the terminology that I'd want to use is uh, the first time I came across it was by a guy called Jesus Gamara, and he'd broken up the types of construction in South America based on uh, whether it was rock that looked like it had been deformed or molded and then the second phase, that's called Hanan Pacha. The second phase is Uran Pacha, which is high precision megalithic construction. And then lastly, we've got Ukun Pacha, which is where there's clearly the use of tools. Now, each of those is probably split in half as well. So it's likely predating this modern era, there has been at least six functioning civilizations that are largely unknown to modern history and modern archaeology. But there could have been much more. And I just use these this terminology because a lot of the slides I have are from South America. And I think 
Jesus Gamar is kind of one of the uh, icons of the, the concept of pre-Inca and um, pre-South American civilizations. And then also that information from each one of these does make it into the next uh, civilization. And often it's only as mythology, but often it's actually there are people who remember. And so I, I feel that Tartaria is the end of this uh, long lineage of cataclysm. So I'll just show you on this slide. There's two really important parts. One is I, I feel very strongly to a, a legislator in ancient Greece called Solon, and he travelled to Egypt to learn about the history of the Greeks or the Hellens, and it was written about by Plato many years later, about 300 years later. But when he went there, the thing that really shocked him is the Greeks felt that they were this pillar of civilization. I feel it's how sometimes we get uh, a bit ahead of ourselves, especially when you're young <clears throat> and you're, you know, you're reading books about history and everything seems to be known and well understood. To then have someone almost laugh at you and say, what a childish idea that you know your history. It's nothing like you remember. You actually don't have a memory at all. And so this happened two and a half thousand years ago that the dominant civilization at the time was getting told, no, there was, there was not just one mud flood, there wasn't just one deluge, but there was many and they're, they're actually the foundation of um, current civilization is how that knowledge and information has trickled on. So here's kind of the breakup of it, the Hanan Pacha, the Uran Pacha, and the Yukun Pacha. And you can see this in some ways kind of a decline in the construction and social um, forms. The last couple of years, I think, if anything, have kind of shown us that how far down quickly our <laughs> civilization <laughs> descend. Um, <laughs> but uh, I feel there were people just like us. All through history, doesn't matter what era it was, there was people looking back and saying something's wrong with history. What can we learn and discover from it? And I think two of the important things is one, you can actually reinvent that technology, that lost technology, but also the understanding of it for me is very important to kind of decide on the progression, like where are we going? You know, if we if we don't know where we came from, it's very hard to know where we're going as a, a culture. Um, and so I want to just break, I'll break it up into the Hunan Pacha. As you can see there, there's big stone slabs. There's no tool marks on those stone slabs. Um, they're all uniform in that, in that way. The Uran Pacha would be uh, pre-Younger Dryas periods so and more than 12,000 years old. And now it's openly recognized that there were cultures, there were megalithic cultures older than that, but archaeologists don't want to recognize that they had any kind of form of technology or advancement. And then we go into the Yukun Pacha, which is the modern Pacha, but it's separated by what most people call the mud floods. That there seems to be extreme high level architectural precision uh, lasting for a very long period. And then it kind of just stops and some things appear to have been claimed to be much younger than they are. And so you can pick almost any culture in the world and you'll find these same groups, whether it's in ancient Greece and it's the, the creator gods and then they create the titans and they create the gods and there's, you know, upheaval and battles, uh, you know, one layer against the, <clears throat> against the next. And then at some point they interbreed with humans and at some point there's a great hero. And you can take that to almost any culture in the world uh, and you'll find the same format. And I've written here just this high-speed press drill because I mentioned this at a conference once and I found it one of the most fascinating things that I'd come across. So I'll just show you why I think it's so fascinating is uh, archaeologists found the remnants of a, a new type of hominid and they called it Denisovan. And of course, all 
ancient uh, hominids or relics of humans, of Homo sapiens even, they're always put down as being incredibly um, uh, uncultured. They're brutes. They always paint them and draw them as these kind of hunkering brutes. While every single culture on earth would look at them more like Atlantis and say, well, every single culture says there was high civilization, there was technology we don't have, there was spiritual connection we don't have, there was an understanding of beauty that we don't have. Uh, and then the archaeologists always come along and say, no, 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 they were just living in caves with a little fire. So they found this hominid, and in it they found a bracelet. I'll just move the mouse over. That's the, the actual bracelet. It's just broken in half there. This is what they believe it would have looked like and there's a hole in it with a leather strap attaching to uh, another smaller little jewel that's what they that's what they believe it was I don't think they actually found that component but the leather has worn one side of the drill mark for the bracelet the other side is still intact and on the other side with a very precise microscope you can actually see the cut marks of the drill that was used to make the bracelet they've wow. now uncovered many of these and they originally dated it to 20,000 years old and then it went 30 40 50 and now it's sitting at around the 70,000 years old but there's there's multiple layers in it but what just fascinated me was the microscope analysis of the bracelet showed that it was cut with an easel speed drill. And we don't really use that term in Australia. We normally use the term press drill. But what it means is whatever cut it was spinning incredibly fast. And if you just Google easel speed drill and just have a look at the images that pop up, the images are always the same. The, the speed drill or press drill has a single axis and the drill bit moves up and down very uniformly. So it leaves a very particular and unique uh, uh, cutting edge. And this is the thing I found so amazing. And I mentioned this at a conference once and it, it took people a bit by surprise. And they were saying, what do you think these ancient hominids also had a Ryobi high-speed press drill? And I was saying, no, not necessarily, but someone did. And it was either at 70,000 years ago or older. That's completely admitted in the, um, in the archaeological record. Yet it was very difficult to even get a conversation about that. So then just looking a bit further at what is, um, what, who are the Dennis Ovens, you don't hear much about them because they're pretty much the lower end of what you'd call a giant as well. The original molar that was found, uh, they thought it was a bear tooth at first because it's so much bigger than a human molar. And as time progressed and they realized they were very big uh, and they were a hominid species, they then had to start to see how they matched genetically with all of the other skulls and skeletons. And the reason it's really interesting is this group of skulls at the bottom, these are photos that I've taken. These top two are from that um, archaeological assessment. You can see on their teeth, the teeth are actually rounded up towards the molars, similar to how Denisovan and Neanderthals are. Well, human teeth are dead flat. Uh, and you'll also see the elongated skulls, um, usually rectangular eye sockets. So what really fascinated me, what started my search around the world was really looking at what humans are. What Are we a hybrid of these other hominids or are we something unique? Um, did we evolve separately or is evolution uh, perhaps doesn't work? The main mechanisms don't work as uh, scientists think they do with random mutation. Uh, so that's kind of how it started. And then I realized that very quickly you did have to break it up into the different types of construction because this Hun and Pacha type of construction you sometimes see in Europe, uh, in Japan, 
in South America, and you'll see it at the bottom of a cathedral. And when you, I'll get into the, the construction exactly, but when you realise what it is, you realise there's no way it could have been made at the time that any church or cathedral was made. It's much older. And so if you can start to see the hallmarks of it, and what it looks like, uh, you realise that some cultures have come across the same areas and for whatever reason, potentially just because it's already a foundation, but potentially that site on earth has some value that we may not have recognised. And it's an important site. So the next culture builds on the same site and then the next culture builds on the same site. And sometimes you'll see all these layers of construction. So Han and Pacha is whenever there is these large slabs, no tool marks on them. Uh, and you can see, can you guys see that little step? Yep. Mm -hmm. there? You'll often see those as well. I'm not sure how clear that stands out, but sometimes there'll be a whole wall that's sheared off perfectly. Like you can put a laser on the wall and it's millimetre precision flat. And then there's a very small little step. Sometimes it'll just be a tiny bump. And the smallest one I've come across is about the size of a five cent coin or size of a marble, half a marble. And it's in the middle of a rock like this one. And so it's very strange why any culture like would shave off that entire rock face and just leave out certain very small little bumps, perfectly carved, perfectly symmetrical, or these little steps. Mm. Um, yeah, so when you see it, if you see something that's dead flat like that, you see it in the Middle East, see it everywhere, uh, and there'll be a small protrusion. That's kind of the hallmark of this Hanan Pacha, no tool marks and yet small protrusion. And this is the next phase. So the idea is that that phase of civilization, whether it was us as Homo sapiens or whether it was some other hominid or whether it's something separate, when it ended, there's no more uh, of that kind of rock slab construction. And you'll see a like a black mat layer between that construction and this construction, which is the Uran Pacha construction. And again, it's broken into two parts. So at every one of these that I go through, you'll be able to find somewhere, you'll find a wall or you'll find on a hillside, you'll find somewhere where there's a geological change between these constructions. Uh, much like the idea of the mud flood, that, that something major happened and it's actually left a remnant in the, the local geology. Uh, and in this case, you can see up the top here, there's a couple of very small stones that have been packed into this wall. And this is a, a famous wall in Peru because it's got this paw print here. There's a puma, like a big cat. Paw. Oh, wow. Mm. That's, that's cool. It's super cool, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, when the Spanish found this wall, they wanted to know how it was built. And the Inca said to them, uh, we didn't build it. It was already here when we got here. We just cleaned around it. And the Spanish pulled some of these rocks off and smashed them open to see if there was something in them. And the Inca had to repair them. And so that's the Inca repair work. It's still very very high quality uh, stone masonry, but it's nothing compared to, you know, 200 ton megalithic blocks. And these blocks in between them, the joins are so precise, they're airtight. So this is then the second phase, this very large megalithic phase the world went through. Uh, and then it's also uh, ended, it ends at a cataclysm. And after that, you'll see this phase, which is also Urumpacha, it's also very high precision stonework, but it's not massive. It's not the megalithic size. So you'll always see in the same order. At the bottom will be the Hananpacha. Then above that will be the very large megaliths sitting on top of them. And then you can see sometimes where they've either been impacted in a cataclysm and they've fallen down the mountain. And then on top of the gaps is the second type of Uran Pacha. And then lastly, on top of that is the modern era. So all of these photos are all within about 
five kilometers of each other. Um, and so again, this modern era that we live in right now is divided in half into two components as well. The Ukun Pacha is, uh, has some very strange formations, very strange construction, really beautiful. But we don't actually know the purpose of them. And if you go to Moray, this big hole in the ground, the tour guides say that it was probably used as an agricultural experiment site because at the bottom of it, there's a one degree temperature change between that and the top. And that's so crazy because at the back of that hill that you can see, it drops down three kilometers and there's about a 15 degree temperature change. There's massive temperature change, it makes no sense. Um, so most of these, I will say, I have a good instinct of when something's wrong. I know when a narrative's wrong, but I don't actually have a cohesive logical theory. I don't know what that site actually is. That's still a mystery. Uh, and then finally, this is the stonework that we can definitely prove was made in the modern era. That's a Machu Picchu. We know that that can be replicated. It's a dry stone wall. You see it all over the world. And in the history books, when one group has gone to another area, that is the construction method being used, stone on stone. So they're basically the three different um, age, ages of construction. And the concept is that after each age, there's new words, new terms, new languages, new construction, but we've kept the same um, format as in we're still moving on the same path, same direction. We are going to get another cataclysm <laughs> eventually. Um, and then it'll be our job to pass on this knowledge. And so I'm just going to show you this Hanan Pacha um, seat. It's one of the seats on the border. Of, um, I was going to say it's on the border of Peru and Bolivia. It's not. I think it's just north of Cusco, this one. But you can see how it's just kind of molded out of rock it doesn't look like it's been chipped there's no tool marks in it but you wouldn't be able to tell anyway because it's just so old it's so eroded uh if rock eroded at that rate over a thousand years or whatever the um whatever the culture assigned to it around the world you'll find these in china you find them in europe you find them all over the place uh, there wouldn't be a rock left on the planet if rocks eroded that much in a thousand years. These rocks are apparently millions of years old uh, and there's the same amount of erosion on the part that's been constructed as the part that hasn't been constructed. So I'm not sure of the, the age of this, but I'm guessing it's much older than the last glaciation, than the Ice Age. And that's also because you won't find any of this Hun and Pacha anywhere that was glaciated. You only find it in places that haven't had ice over them. Um, and then, as I said, each one of these ends with a cataclysm. And the best place to look at that is Sacsayhuaman in Peru. This rock here on the right is a different type of rock to the rock on the left. You actually see they're kind of a little bit different colour. They've both been carved. You can see some of the carvings under here. Again, this is the very old. Uh, style that you only see at the foundation level but there's no it's called the upside down staircase because the you know archaeologists say they must have carved it upside down they most certainly didn't that was carved the right way up and then something flipped that massive rock and you can tell because on the join the rocks are actually being smashed together and you can see some of the marks where this rock is wedged between the two. And if you go up underneath and inside, you'll see in some places they've both been carved to the point where they've been smashed together and you can only, you can't even get a GoPro in there. You can only get a little camera in. So this was built, this massive rock was built right way up and then by unknown cataclysm, was turned upside down, flipped over. You can actually see the hole in the ground where this came from. It's about 150 metres away. And it's been flipped over and smashed into this face. And, you, and you'll see like cracks and uh, damage all over it on the impact site. 
And there would be hundreds of these. There's hundreds of these over South America where they're not just like a hundred ton rock. There are a million tons. And you can, some of them, you can climb up right inside and push a camera up and actually see the join. So they definitely, this definitely wasn't carved in this position. It was carved the other way. So that's just trying to give an idea of the size of the cataclysms um, after each age. And this one I think is really interesting because it's on the technique of how they would have carved uh, these rocks out. Um, Jesus Gamara believes that the rocks through sound actually became soft and they could be molded and they could be pulled apart. So they were still using a cutting mechanism, but it was like cutting plasticine. And I actually think that looks entirely consistent on this image. If you imagine someone cutting this out, as they tear that away, there would be areas like this that wouldn't tear neatly. And there'd be other areas that would actually not tear neatly. Again, they'd pull out of the base rock. So just to give you a comparison, the current archeological understanding is that all of these tiny little bumps, and I mean, they're microscopic here, absolutely microscopic down to these very complex shapes, apparently were carved by the Inca for unknown reason, a culture that doesn't have metal, hard metal tools. Um, and when you look really closely in it, you'll see there's little pockets and air bubbles inside it. It's one of the strangest rock formations when you get up close to it that I've ever seen. Um, and to me, I would say it looks entirely consistent with this being almost plasticine-like and being pulled apart and torn at these points, as opposed to millions of workers for a thousand years hammering away with tiny little chisels. Um, so yeah, that's just, just touching on the construction technique there. Uh, and then in the Uran, it's not the same uh, exact same concept of very large slabs being pulled apart, but the precision is so unbelievable. You know, this is a separate rock to this. This run is about four meters deep and this rock changes shape, this little rock, as it goes along. So there's no way you could make that by either grinding them together or doing anything similar. They have to be carved perfectly so that they're like sub-millimeter precision. And these walls run for kilometers and kilometers and kilometers. Whatever method they used to make that precision, there is nothing like it today. And as I said, in, uh, or as you very kindly said in the bio, my speciality was precision in construction. And even with the 3D scanners and you know CNC machines and printers, and it wouldn't matter what you use, you would never be able to make this. It's an order of magnitude better than the highest precision that we can make today. Uh, and so this is the, uh, the cracks between two massive slabs. These two rocks are about, uh, 30, 40 ton each. And the, the crack between them, you can barely see. And it runs the whole way down on um, each side of each brick as well. These aren't as massive as this, but uh, it's still like, even if that was a rock wall today, there's no one that could possibly make a rock wall as perfect as that now. And apparently, of course, it was built with this. This is the <laughs> the preferred <laughs> tool. <laughs> <laughs> to a high precision <laughs> and, um, and so this place this is called Cori Cancha and what I was so fascinated about this again it's so precise the rock joins are airtight and again I don't know what this was used for the construction's so strange in in how it looks it looks like it was built to house a massive machine is what it looks like there's rails and there's ports and there's holes that bend at very particular points. Um, yeah, I don't know what it was, but whatever it was would be absolutely fascinating because every brick, like this is a model of this brick right here, block, uh, none of them are square. There's not a square edge in the whole place. So you couldn't just make the blocks like we do square and sit them on top of each other. Every single one is non-vertical or horizontal. 
And so every single face in three dimensions all has to be uniquely and perfectly fitting. And I can just, I absolutely guarantee there's no one that can even come close to that today. The Lima uh, University, when I was over there, were doing a test run of trying to make them. They always do this, but every seven years, they try to show that it was possible for the Inca to make them. And they got two rocks that were about the size of house bricks. Uh, no, three, three rocks the size of house bricks. And they ground them together, which means, firstly, you can't get shapes like this if you're grinding them together. So it's not the methodology. But even still, it took them three and a half months with I think there's about 20 people, and they got one of the faces to be reasonably close to this. But, of course, it was a dead straight square face. So whatever the methodology is, I certainly don't know. And then this is just to give you an idea of that precision. This wall here, um, I think it was that corner there. I then just walked up a bit closer and took another photo here and then went closer again. You can see the there's basically no gap, like there's no mortar. The thickness of the error margin is much thinner than the black line on the on the tape measure. There's there's just absolutely nothing like it today. And also this they said that the face of this was made by chiseling, and it's not. It's actually aerated. You can see little bubbles in it. If you get up very close with a needle, you can actually pop the bubbles and you can see that it's a very thin micro shell over them. So whatever the construction technique was, it certainly wasn't hammering with a, another rock. And the other thing, this is a, all around the world as well. You get this in China and Japan and in Europe and um, in Africa and Middle East. When you see this ultra high precision, there's also a strange effect like vitrification, but it's not, where you'll get this spalling and whole faces will just fall off. And the rock underneath, the last layer of that rock will be the last layer to have these little tiny bubble marks. And so something has changed the nature of the construction material. Because when you look at these ones, I do have, I've got a couple of photos that are even more zoomed in. And the crystals of one rock touch the crystals of the other rock. So you can't get better precision. They've literally reached the limit of construction precision. Um, and yeah, and whenever you see it, if you ever even see this and it's not high precision, very likely what you're looking at is a building like this that has collapsed or been pulled apart in the modern era and they've put it back together and they've messed up how they've put it together. So you don't get the high precision, but you do get this spalling and this pockmark. And so this is the, the idea that these rocks were actually somehow made soft. The other thing is you'll see uh, impacts in them. Like this one here on the top left, the outside of this ridge here protrudes above the rest of the rock face by about three millimeters. So if it was built with tools the way that I would build by, you know, having something that shaves bits of rock off, why would you leave three millimeter little ledge like this? And here it's much bigger. Here it's about 15 millimeters. This looks like as um, Jesus Gamaro, you know, his theory, this looks entirely consistent that this rock was soft. Something pushed in there. That's an impact of some sort. And this protruded out. Otherwise, the theory is this whole 200 ton rock was shaved off just to leave that little part. And here again, this one, this is a, a borehole that goes through very hard rock. These rocks are andesite and granite. Um, if you ever watch someone cut a granite bench top in a kitchen and they'll have a drill going at full revs, pouring water on it to keep it down. It'll take like a million revolutions to cut per millimeter. Well, on this hole through this rock, you can kind of see there does look like there's um, very old drill marks on it. However, the bit rate is massive. It's like multi five millimeters per spin. And then also this here, 
is where a rock has been pushed, a hard rock has been pushed in against that. It only goes halfway down and then you can see where the rock is. So it looks again entirely consistent like this was somehow made soft. And as they drill that hole, they pushed a piece of rock into it accidentally and it left that scarring and then the rock's still sitting there embedded into this, uh, I think this is andesite. And so I'll just, I've mostly wanted to just show uh, South America, but there's some better pictures to demonstrate this in Indonesia as well. This is a, near a national park called Law Lindu in Sulawesi. And these are very kind of like Easter Island-ish, these heads. And you see on the outside of them, this kind of strange white mark. Um, I'm not sure, have you guys ever seen anything like that before? Never. No. Not, I don't think I have, no. I've been looking for it in Australia. People have said they've seen it in Australia, so I've kind of been looking at some, um, uh, like not only just archaeological but modern historic buildings that may have been built on an older, um, an older material, an older foundation. But again, it it doesn't. Firstly, it definitely doesn't look like that was made by a chisel. Um, and this hole in the middle, the same thing. See how it actually protrudes out there? Mm. Anywhere you... It's melted, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, anywhere you see that protrusion in to one of these, um, like, megalithic statues, if you see something that looks like it's been pushed into it, I guarantee you there'll be a ridge around the outside that looks entirely consistent with it being... Uh, soft at the point of impact and then on the outside of it everywhere you see this yeah it looks melted looks it 100 mm. percent looks like the rocks melted like when um like when you push a, a stamp or something into play-doh mm, exactly yeah, yeah exactly the same wow yeah. that is in, that's incredible it's really it's really strange <laughs> it is <laughs> this is the um this is the exact three photos that um that stopped me undertaking a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. I'd oh, say, dear. I oh, know. I oh, know. I did it for about six months and then this is what I wanted to investigate and I was doing very um, high-def precision imagery and 3D modelling to try to work out. I just want to know what this is, mm -hmm. what made it, and then it was a little too controversial and, um, yeah, one day just I got locked out of the... Uh, of the emails and everything it was just done oh. yeah you but got it, yeah but now i got you guys so yeah <laughs> <laughs> lucky us <laughs> that's right um so this is another one again just going into that the type of construction if if someone was going to carve this out i should have put an after photo in here anyway these eventually become giant jars and they have lids on them so this middle part's going to be all dug out, you know, constructed out. And this one has just started and then the cataclysm has hit and it's been stopped. And I'll show you some photos later. You can see where this civilization was up to. But again, there's no tool marks. There's not a chisel mark in the entire thing. It's They're all rocks at similar level to um, andesite and, and granite, these incredibly hard rocks yet with no metal tools known, no chisel marks, and it looks like it's been scooped out. It looks consistent with it being somehow soft. And again, anywhere you see something that looks like it's been scooped out, on the outside edges, you'll see this same kind of strange, I don't know what it is, but yeah, it looks like it's melted or it's um, you know a byproduct of some chemical process or something similar. So you see this all over the world. Once you notice it, you'll you'll see it everywhere. But also, um, just to show you the difference in uh, the age of these rocks, so this is one of the jars up the top here, and this is one. This is another jar here. You see the inscriptions on it, and um, this is another one here. This is what the lids look like. They got like kind of unique. Uh, hominid patterns on the lids 
we'll have to go into the mythology one day because I'm pretty sure that this is related to the creation of humans. Um, but also... Cute. Look at the size of them compared to people. Yeah. Compared to Weibo, that's my mate. Oh, is that? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so this one, though, was always sitting on top of the ground. So where this one was found is on a hill on top, and it's on the top of the ground and it's been weathering since it was made. While these ones have been uncovered, these have all been uncovered. This one here sitting on top of the ground, these three uncovered. So one of the things that I realised a long time ago is once you find one megalithic site, you can usually find the others. This, is, this kind of links in with the mud flood in that if you find one, the others will be buried underneath it. So that ridge there in the background, that used to be a mound that came up over the top of these. And this and this is sitting on top of it. And then they dug into it and they found other ones. And so, of course, these ones aren't eroded because they've only been sitting out for a very short amount of time. Like even if they were uncovered by the Dutch, then it's only a couple of hundred years. While some of them have been sitting out in the open for a very long time. So I don't know how long, but it's basically that's the way that I make discoveries when I travel is I'm, it's really simple. I'm just going to places that have uh, one or two megalithic sites and then you can see where one has been moved. And if it's been moved, then you just search the area, look for a mound and dig into the mound. Wow. So yeah. do you think that there's more that are yet to be uncovered in those in oh. that region? Oh, yeah. Like we, uh, Stephen and I made um, two entirely new discoveries, new sites, complete new sites while we're over there. And we found, um, I don't have any photos of it, but yeah, we found things that are so unbelievably strange. Like in the middle of the jungle, uh, these farmers cut into a, say in the back of this hillside here, it's very steep country. And even though it's in Indonesia, it's very high up, it's quite cool. It was only about 19 degrees when we were there. They cut into these mountains. These mountains get a lot of rain. They catch a lot of rain. And they'll cut in and divert the water over from its natural path over onto a new creek. And then they irrigate down the bottom. So at the bottom of these, you'll see wherever a creek comes out, there'll be a large amount of farming. But sometimes also they go up and they just cut through where one creek is to, and it's quite serious construction, uh, to create a new irrigation line. The we already knew this place would be a place that it, we'd find something. So we're already there. And then we started finding pieces of pottery and really strange pottery. The, you could tell them the matting and the cutting and the shaping of it. It's nothing I've ever seen before. And it was underneath uh, the megalithic sites. So the, the, irrigation line had created a new creek that creek is now just carving a path down a hill you know normally the creek's in a very predictable place but now it's in a new place so it's just carving into the the jungle mm -hmm. and meters under the ground like meters down we found a massive pot and then a series of pots and other pots in other place as soon as we realized now this was something that you can look for um but the megalith was on top of it. And so you could tell by the, because it had carved it so neatly, it was almost like an excavator had just carved it in because as the, the creek's running down, it's just eroding that steep bank. And you could see the pot had been buried up to its lid. It was probably about two or three feet high, massive pot, up to its lid with white sand. Then it had a layer, another material layer put on. Then it had the normal kind of jungle soil put on over the top of that so if you, you'd only cut in two meters it would just look like the jungle but if you mm. keep digging lower and lower and lower you eventually get this you know constructed sand layer filled with pots and then above it were uh, megaliths wow yeah so it was uh that in my head and it's insane 
it's it was so crazy unfathomable, really to think that that's below the ground yeah that's right yeah. and and uh we were obviously hoping that it'd be filled with ancient technology or gold or <laughs> a lost scroll or something and if uh, only yeah if only. but it actually turned out there was there's nothing definable in it we told the german archaeological uh institute or something it was a german archaeological group were um in very close to where we were we're in a national park called law lindu but they were very close so we had the guide tell them and where it was and then someone came back and said oh yeah they found a few others as well mm. and yeah, but they've never published anything about it. So I can't even find any photos of it. I've got the only photos that I can find of these sites. We found two additional sites that were unknown. Um, but anyway, the person from the archaeological group said, no, it's actually lucky that there's no gold in them because otherwise every uh, megalithic site would be destroyed. Mm -hmm. People in droves would be going That's to right. start <laughs> digging. So, yeah, lucky it's just a mystery. But yeah. uh, What a but, find, though, huh? Mm, yeah, it's really good. We made a few finds that trip. That was um, We only had two weeks, so we, we kind of had a bit of a battle plan as, to find as much as we could. And, uh, yeah, we found all up, I think we found four or five new sites, but two of them in particular were completely unknown. Um, and we use a bit of a mix of aerial imagery and mythology and then we actually have a look at how the ground's terraformed. I should do uh, make a video just on how to make discoveries because it's... Totally sure it's, that would be excellent. Yeah, because it's not that hard. <laughs> and some of the places that I've been to in Tassie the last few months are just insane. Mm. Like I... You feel like you're literally in the middle of nowhere and there's some weird stuff around. So, yeah, I would like to know how to make discoveries. Mm. Imagine you could actually start digging, Casey. Just take your oh, shovel yeah. with you when you go on your hikes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally good. Yeah, mm. Just fold up and put in my backpack. Yeah. Because yep. <laughs> Tasmania is like that. Like it is, it's nearly as far from anywhere as anywhere can be. Oh, and. Actually, I'll send you some photos after this time. I saw some a rock today. It's called the Balancing Rock, and it, it's oh, massive, I'm all in. <laughs> huge. It looks like a megalith. Have you, have you ever seen my Instagram channel? <laughs> yes, I have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. It's um, all about rocks, isn't it? It's, it's about, rocks. about balancing rocks. <laughs> balancing this rocks. One yeah. is massive. It's huge, and it's just balancing on this other kind of. It looks like it's a like a base, mm. another, this huge, another slab, I don't know, another rock. It's just, it's a crazy place where I am at the moment. It's, there's just massive, massive rocks everywhere. Yeah. Oh, anyway. Yeah, I'd love to check it out. So there was one in Finland that was a, you know, balancing rock. It's quite a few all over the world and they're, mm. they're famous. But when I was looking at it, they said, oh, yeah, the this rock came down in a glacier and just, balance perfectly yeah little point mm. and i was like look if anyone knows how hard it is to balance rocks like check my Instagram channel. it's pretty hard <laughs> <laughs> and then we ended up finding one where they, they were like have a look at this one it's two rocks balancing on top of each other and then when we looked at it i was like no 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 these rocks are already here you can actually you could see the seam in the rock but it was upside down i was like these rocks have been they were laying here and then someone has not only balanced them, but turned the middle one upside down so that you could stand on the side. The seam runs left to right from the top rock and then right to left in the middle rock and then left to right back again at the bottom. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I was like, I don't think this is natural. Like no. Someone, someone did this. Um, mm, it's to be continued. Definitely to be continued. Yes. <laughs> um and this is also the end of this um, cataclysm. I've got me in there for scale. I've got to put me in. Um, the, this is so long ago, though, the cataclysm of the high precision. So you can see the high precision of these rocks. It gets incredible. Yet there's this massive gap here 
this whole area moved that way about a foot and a half. It's not the way normally you get earth deformation. You know, typically, if you get deformation, it, you'll have a, a longitudinal line along here. You'll see it starting to move down. You'll start getting torsion cracks. You, it's really predictable. And if it's an earthquake, it falls over. Well, this actually looks like this half of the building has moved to the right. So it actually tore the land apart, whatever it was. It was more like an earthquake in a movie that just creates a gap in the land. Mm -hmm. Just shifted it slightly. Yeah. Mm. And then you can see sometimes the Incas have just piled up rocks at the back. But they're just, you can see here, this is the Inca construction, rock on rock construction. This is not. Um, and these are pretty serious sized slabs also because none of this rock is found at Machu Picchu and that hill in the back in the background there that's about how steep the hill at Machu Picchu is so someone took these rocks these 20 30 40 ton rocks up a hill to build this very strange structure a very long time ago and but the other reason we know it's a very long time ago is none of the roads remain. There's not a sign of how anyone got these rocks up the top of the hill. Um, when the Spanish, before they found Machu Picchu, when the, back at um, Saxiwam and they found the quarry, which is about 10, 15 kilometres away and crosses numerous creeks and, and cliffs like this, and the Spanish wanted to see if they could move one of these rocks that was still at the quarry. And it was about the size, it was a bit bigger than this. And they took 5,000 men to move it. And they moved it about 150 metres. And then their housing broke and it rolled down the hill and killed about 50 people. And then they just went, you know, they can't be moved. It's impossible. If you can't do it with 5,000 men, you can't do it. Um, and that rock is still at the bottom of the canyon right now. No one can get it back up. It's like, I think it's probably about 100 tonne. It's just too big. So, yeah, there's so much mystery around this. I've made a lot of, I, I was making a lot of calculations at one point about how to move them and how to, I feel that if we could figure out some of, just one small component of this technology, the rest of it would would kind of come. We'd start understanding whatever we're missing. But um, But no, I haven't been able to. So then also back to the mud floods, a lot of these megalithic sites and these old sites, they've been, I think, hit by more than one. And give you just an example of one is you'll see stones like this that have been out and are really weathered. And, you know, if you cut a stone like that, I mean, there's, these stones exist right around the corner. And they're the same amount of erosion. So I don't know how old they are, but I constantly feel like if rocks eroded like that in 200 years, there'd be no rocks on the planet. They just all erode. So I don't know how old it is, but if you actually dig them up from under the ground, you see things like this channeling and these drill holes. Uh, and they, they've got very precise and sharp edges. And they look like they've been cut with machines. Yet everything outside looks as weathered as this. And so the difference is where this happened. Um, I, again, I'm not quite sure what this hill is exactly. So it's at a place called Tiwanaku, and there's two big megalithic sites there. The other one's called Pumapunku. And they're constantly digging, so people have dug uh, blocks out. But if you look in, you can see there's walls under there. There's like potentially rooms in here um, there's other rocks buried under here but most of them most of the rocks there's a slab up there you can see some of the slabs some of the rocks are on top of the mound but most of them are buried and it honestly looks like some giants just picked up like a sand bucket and just dumped it on top of it it's the site's completely wrecked but also this is on a floodplain so this hill is completely unnatural however it got there is not natural but everything's just caked and just filled with mud um, and smashed over and so 
this is that same hill in the background. And so there have been theories on how this happened. The, even the Incas had theories on how that could have happened, how you can get a pile of something like that. Um, one theory was that the, well, hang on, I'll go. There's a couple. There's, of course, tsunamis and there's deluges and there's even, you know, ash clouds, kind of raining mud. But for this one, the most likely candidate I felt was actually that it had come up from the ground because the way that the rocks have all fallen and been destroyed, they all push out from the center point. Well, if it was hit by a wave, you'd expect them all laying in the direction they were hit. Well, they're all, they look like they've been laid over and thrown from the middle point, like a bomb went off, but a bomb that also created a 30 meter high mound of mud. So um, I actually really got interested in this for a while. I, went um we'd go camping and actually look for places where you can predict where the water will come out of the ground um i've got a video of that as well of camping and it's just we're on top of a hill and it's completely dry and then we find the place and sure enough water starts coming out of it um i'll have to i'll send you that and see what you think but i think it adds a really interesting element to the idea of mud floods that they're multi um the mechanisms are multiple it's not just one thing um what do you guys think about that is that you know i've never actually thought about um, the how a mud flood would actually occur and to think that something could be pushed from underground possibly which is what you're saying mm. and pushing everything up from underneath and everything sort of falling in place i, I mean i've never never even mm. thought that that could possibly be aware but i'm so i'm sure there's multiple hmm. you know like you said different uh methods uh for a flood mud flood i guess hmm. yeah i i i don't really have a lot on this because just a lot of the sites i've gone to even in europe where there's a site buried in mud and then they're digging up you know and they've built another town on top of it you go to england somewhere and then they dig through the bottom of it and then they find out there's another town buried under that one. But you're standing on the top of a hill. I was like, how did this happen? How did but, you know? I, I was thinking like of a, a huge geyser when you yes. said it, but then would there not be a, a big hole? Yes, that's it. That I'll show you the video of the one that I filmed because it's beautiful, clear water. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until it was an old farmer that told me about this, that there's certain places where before you get a major flood event, mm -hmm. uh, the water from the earth will push up through it and it makes these like little volcanoes. Mm -hmm. So I filmed one, found one at the top of this hill. And I mean, we're at the top of a hill. It's, it'd be, I don't know, uh, it'd have to be elevation at 200 metres. And yeah, we followed it up and found it. And but when it finished, so it ran for two days. Oh. Uh, it did all then just kind of muddy up and clog up, and it's just like a, you know, it's kind of a little dome of dirty water. But while it was running, it was the cleanest, purest water you'd ever seen. Wow! Yeah. And I filmed it, but I'll turn the sound off because I kind of get a bit excited in it. <laughs> <laughs> discovering a hole in the ground <laughs> um, it's the little things you know it's the little things <laughs> so, um, this one the, the, this is what I wanted to point out also about our history being rewritten like as I said I feel for Solon who went to Egypt and was suddenly told you're you're a child with amnesia you, there's no technology that you have that is old that's what they told him. There's no science you have that is old. Everything is just this like modern, you know, postmodern kind of crap. And mm -hmm. um, and I mean, and to give you an idea of how interesting I've, or like just, I'm just trying to segue a little bit, is I started looking up some of the technology that was discussed. So Roman technology, I feel, is very similar to our technology. It's just, you know, it was a bit more primitive. And 
the Egyptians were saying, "You've com- this is rubbish. You've completely lost the methodology of technology, of transport, of energy, of everything. And Solon eventually agrees, and he comes back with historians and he says, you know, now we agree there was this cataclysm, there was this massive flood. And then the Egyptian says, kind of like, well, finally you remember one, but there were many before. And it's like, no matter how far you go back, you always you always go, oh man, there's so much more to know. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, the technology, I started looking up the concepts that they talked about with this technology because it's linked to uh, much more recent Tartarian technology. They use the same words. They use these same terms about harnessing nature and harnessing vibration and and you see some of the same shapes carved in the walls of Egypt as then you do on a you know Tartarian church as you do you know somewhere else in a a modern system and I came across a little book of this ancient technology and how you utilize nature and while I was googling it I came across another guy who was looking into the same thing and he got a trout and what he's the the egyptians were basically saying that if you want to travel in the water you push through the water and like we do now if we want to travel through the air we create a propeller and we cut through the air and it's not efficient you have to use huge power that's why there's no flight if you're cutting through the air um the only things in nature that cut through air are like leaves that are designed to spin and slow down because they've got a seed pod. So cutting through the air is inefficient. Pushing through the water is inefficient. And this guy went back through this kind of you know Tartarian um, technology. And one of the things to test it, and it was so fascinating, he had caught a trout and he gutted the trout. He's going to eat it. And then he took it back into the stream and he just holds it in the stream right behind a rock. And it takes a little while, if you find the video, it takes like 30 seconds or something. And eventually the fish gets in the sink with the, the vortexes in the stream and it's just swimming on its own. And there's this fish that's dead. It's got no guts. And it's just swimming. And then eventually a bigger kind of surge of water comes past. And as that vortex hits it, it's flies up and it moves forward to the next rock and so he's got this dead fish swimming up a stream just using that vortex on its tail as each the you know it's perfectly designed to capitalize on the natural energy around it um yeah that's i kind of became fascinated with that for a while (laughs) have you come across that no no yeah, I'm mind blown. <laughs> um, this uh, I better get back to this video. This will go for a hundred years. This uh, the reason I wanted to point this is just about how much information gets lost, and then an archaeologist comes along and says, "Ah, oh, this is what it is." When I came across this, I was like, "What caused this level of erosion?" Yet there's no erosion on the brick wall, and the brick wall isn't very precise. You know, by my dating, this should be a very precise brick wall. But also, how old is this? If it's got that erosion, it looks like it's actually been in water for a very long time or a huge amount of water has rushed past it. Um, So anyway, then I found this, the first drawing of this site, and there's nothing there. The whole That square, the whole site has been rebuilt about 150 years ago, 200 years ago. And now the tour guide you know, because I usually do get a tour, but I like getting the um, the narrative. Yeah, the official narrative. For yeah. Me. Yeah. yeah, and I'm always <laughs> very polite with them <laughs> um, and usually just try to wake them up a little bit. I don't go too hard. But, yeah, he was telling me that this, you know, all the parts of this, what it was for and how the Inca did this and how they did that and blah, blah, blah. And then I found this and I was like, wait a minute, there's nothing there. Someone just built it 200 years ago and they just made all this stuff up. And that's that hill that's just in the middle of the floodplain with, you know, these megaliths all over it. Um, and then I found the first photo of it. And same, so this photo is standing on the hill. That's just, this is a floodplain from there 
even further in the other direction. And so this is all that was there. And then they've just rebuilt it 200 years ago. And even in 200 years, to think that's enough time that now there's an official narrative of what it was used for and what it was. And I'm like, nobody knows. It's like, it's just a barren field. You can see someone had plowed and planted inside of it. And then. Yeah, someone's going to use it as some sort of farmland. And then yeah. and then they built this sort of fake that's other right. structure trying to claim it's just as old, but clearly it's not. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big tourist destination. Tourist, yeah. But I mean those other rocks around there look fascinating. Who knows what they were actually used for? Don't know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. It's there's so much mystery to it. It's hard to know sometimes, you know, when you see a site, you'll go to um even you go to Machu Picchu and there's like two rocks and they'll say do you know what this symbolizes this is the duality of night and day in man and i'm like i'll oh, stop it you know you don't know what <laughs> this is <laughs> you, you, and you people know. eat it up don't they? they eat it up um and so anyway this is the third part of um of, of civilization this is the modern era so the one thing that i've noticed that's a little bit different between the modern era and those other eras the megalithic years is that we don't seem to be just ending on a cataclysm there seems to be this slow decline of beauty architecture science medicine art um it's kind of uh people sorry just <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i feel you know if we are going to get a you know another mud flood all right <laughs> nothing lost this building can go for sure um, oh 100 percent. all those <laughs> contemporary buildings can go bye-bye it's so terrible um so then yeah just a, in regards to how old these things are as well um and just how they get covered up this is in china this is the biggest megalithic site on earth and this isn't the biggest rock this one there's bigger than this so these were going to be used for construction. I really need to make a whole hour on this because it's so fascinating. And look how tiny you are there. <laughs> That's yeah. insane. It's insane. And you can see all the ones that have been removed. So as you come in, there's about 50 of these that are missing, that have gone somewhere. But this is just give you the size of it. You know, everything's in the thousands of tons. So typically, if you ever work in a construction site, as soon as you a normal construction site, as soon as you get above about five ton or something like that, it's a huge amount of trouble. You get a ten ton rock on a road, and they'll get a, you know, a hammer and smash it apart rather than try to move something that weighs ten ton. It'll just fold a truck in half. So the idea of like thousands of tons, there's um. Yeah, there's so many problems with it. But anyway, the thing I find really fascinating about this is, uh, so it was to make a steel, which I'd never heard of that word until I came to this site, but a steel is a three-part tombstone, basically. There's a base and then there's an upright and then there's a bit on top. So this is the largest steel. So it's got a tortoise base. It's got this upright here and then it's got a little cap on top. That's the largest one in all of China. The reason this is so fascinating is the guy who wanted to use this, the Yongle Emperor, he had thought that he would be able to cut this. This is the official narrative, that he'd be able to cut it and move it. Yet he was a man that was famous for building roads and construction and all of these sort of things. It's like there is no way anyone who knows how hard it is to move rock and dirt thought they could move that rock. So the official story goes, the, the Yongle emperor wanted to build this a couple hundred years ago, realised he couldn't, and he built that little one, that little turtle guy there. That little turtle one still took thousands of men to move, extremely difficult to move, and that is nothing compared to that. And this one it was built before the Yongle, the, the Yongle uh, Emperor. So as a narrative, 
the idea is a guy who knew how hard it was to move stones, who had built hundreds of these things, decided to build one a thousand times bigger than the biggest one ever built. And then afterwards went, actually, that's just impossible. And he built one about a third the size of the biggest one ever built. <laughs> and it's like, no. So anyway, I just went on Wiki and just had a look up this young emperor to see whether he's legit. And on the second paragraph, it says he was most famous for destroying records and rewriting history with his name in it. What? Oh, gosh. It's literally like second paragraph. Yeah. And I was like, okay, the, the people who built this, yeah, Chinese, still amazing. I don't want to take anything away from them either. Mm. Of course, this is a little segue, but even though it's nothing compared to whoever was moving these around. But when you look at the size of these, like the combined weight is 250 tons. That's still massive. This is 300 years older than the Yongle Emperor who moved one much, much smaller. It's two metres tall. Mm -hmm. However, I got sent this article once because I've been into kind of moving megaliths for a long time. And someone sent it as a, see, it's not impossible to move megaliths. And I was like, no, this proves my point. This is an 80-ton pharaoh statue in Egypt. They had to move it 400 metres. So around a kid's, uh, you know, soccer field, the track that runs around a school, mm -hmm. that's how far they had to move it. It took them two years, 13 million pounds, over a 1,000 people plus the army. They had to build this massive machine to hold it. They had to build a completely new road because the 80 tons would have destroyed the stabilisation of the road and ruined the road. Yet it was quarried 900 kilometres from the site thousands of years ago. Like, sure, something doesn't add up. <laughs> doesn't add up. I'm like, this is considered now like a great achievement. We moved 80 tons, 400 metres. I'm like, so what? And they had to construct that whole yeah. contraption that is only one single use, mind you. Like that can't That's be used right. again for anything else. And That's it costs right. nearly 14 million Egyptian pounds. Yeah, that's right. Insanity. It's absolute insanity. So, yeah, I don't want to take anything away from the, you know. The feat. It is a feat for us, our small people. <laughs> that's right. If this was legitimately <laughs> built by Chinese as they said it was, then I tip my hat, you did a great job. But still, nothing compared to that. Um, so then this is something that's also kind of strange. These are meant to be lifting lugs, yet if you put a rope on them, they look like they've been made to tie down. The, the flat surface is on top and the bottom surface actually shapes up like this. Mm -hmm. And to lift off that would be really hard. So they, they're not lifting lugs. And also, this is going to be quarried out, supposedly. So they're going to carve that off and this is the top part they're going to use. Why would you have a lifting lug where it's going to be carved out and, you know, the top's going to be taken off? You may as well put it there so you can use it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know the technology that they were using to move these, but it wasn't just lifting them with little lugs. Um, and here's just a way that they cover things up. If you travel for the purpose of kind of uncovering the history of us. Um, this is a rock wall that's been chiseled. That's what I expect to see on a chiseled wall. And then even this, that doesn't look like a chiseled wall. That looks just like someone's put the lines on there to make it look like a chiseled wall because normally you see very sharp cuts. So you can see the roof up here looks exactly how I'd expect it to look, but this may be not. But I'm not an expert, so I'll give them the benefit of the doubt in that. And I was going to say, and I'm definitely not an expert, but I have actually been to cultures that still carve into rock for tombstone, and I have swung a hammer. So I feel I know a little bit more about it than most people. Uh, that there, that size that this guy's carving, he's been in there for, I think, about for months working shifts with a couple of other guys. So that would probably take one person about 
maybe two years or something like that. Um, that would take me probably about 10 years. It is such unbelievably hard work. So I do, I, I can say that that could possibly be chiseling, but the problem is, can you see this like waterfall of white coming down? Mm -hmm. So that's like a calcite deposit. It leaches out of the, the soil up here. Um, and you see it creates these like big waterfall kind of shapes. Where the chiseling takes place, if you imagine if you're using a chisel, uh, you get really good purchase if you're either kneeling down and you're chiseling something on the ground or if you're kind of standing and it's going to probably be about waist height. So the thing I noticed is, is this calcite layer typically takes thousands and thousands or tens of thousands of years to form. It doesn't form in the last 400 years. We're typically looking like 100,000 years for that to form. At the top there, see how there's no uh, white mark there? If you go up on top there, you can see someone's actually sat over there and there's very deep chisel marks along that. Similarly here, you see the chisel marks just kind of stop there. So they've chiseled all over it, but they've definitely done it much harder along this point. So they're actually chiseling off this white calcite layer over time. And I put arrows on here because I've just got to zoom in on this and I'll show you what I mean. So this is that same point. This is under here. Mm -hmm. See at the bottom here, you can still see the rocks that are currently being chiseled off. They've got a bunch of guys working there. You can see where their tools are. You can see where they sleep. They're chiseling this whole structure down to remove this sediment. So why, why are they doing that? Is that just to hide the age or? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So mm. if, if in some places you can see here, they've chiseled so hard, they've cut all the way through this calcite mm. layer. Um, and then on the ground, you can actually see it's very fresh. You can see the white lines uh, and you actually see the bits of rock that's come off. So, and they, they don't even hide that. It's under, they've got a repair or maintenance team and they just, all they have is bloody chisels. And so they're slowly removing this. So I would have a random guess and say, this could easily be a hundred thousand years old. And you look at how much of that sediment. Um, wow. So, yeah, but it is funny. You go all the way around it. You can see where they stop work and the middle part, they always take way longer because it's quite hard to chisel, if you, especially if you're chiseling up at an angle um but also then here you can see the run the chisels all the way over it but it then just stops underneath so there's no chisel marks underneath where it'd be much harder to do and then if you go to the edge of the site this is how it pans out all over the site but you've got a there's a little um tourist fence to keep you in just jump the tourist fence and you see all the chisel marks just stop they just run out and then it's like okay so was this chiseled no just that part and then you trace them back so there's been people working on this and i mean a lot of people even just to put chisel marks all over it would have taken must be 500 people like a year so i don't know if it was originally done by the yongle emperor or not but what i do know is is if you go there now every day you'll see more chisel marks moving around the site moving around the site so they're eventually going to cover up the whole thing and i think eventually they'll remove all of these kind of um, mineral deposits that come down so yeah unfortunately it's an easy way to hide the age of something and then just move it into the the modern era mm, it's very sad actually isn't it it is and i shouldn't this is the last slide i shouldn't have ended on a sad note <laughs> Back a couple, but how, much, how good is this? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a that's kind of what I've spent a lot of my time traveling. Is like, even though, yes, it's a bit of a sad note, I think a lot of people who are interested in ancient history are interested in spirituality or ancient medicine, or it can be anything. You start to become very good at knowing when a narrative's wrong but it can be very hard to know what's right. And I feel that's kind of 
where I am with this is that I spend probably half the time learning about what the narrative is, making sure I'm very confident that it is wrong. And then I kind of more like daydream about how these fit together because I do have a kind of cohesive world view, but it doesn't really fit with, um, you know, the out of Africa hypothesis of human evolution or the random mutations. Um, doesn't really fit with anything from the younger Dryas back. You know, I'm very confident that when um, the Egyptian priests were talking about the deluges before, you will eventually come across Mu or Lemuria or something that's even older than the Atlanteans. And it seems most cultures do have that, that there's, this goes so far back and it's almost like the, it's better before than now. You mm -hmm. know, we're losing, we're losing something. Devolving. Just, yeah, I just found that guy playing the flute with a mask. Just, <laughs> I was like, oh, good times, good times. Oh, dear. Wasn't that long ago, though, Tom? Was it? People yeah. are still wearing masks. Oh. No, I oh, know. Oh, I mean, dear. I feel... I feel for them because I feel for them the same as I feel for people who are really stuck with a narrative, whether it's a historic narrative or a cultural narrative, you know, um, people who are like, it's either left or right, these are our guys, or it's the best civilization ever was whatever, you know, the Romans did this or whatever. People get locked into narratives and I think life's very hard for them. I think it's much more interesting to look at showing what's wrong, the narratives that's wrong, and then really starting to dig deep and going down those rabbit holes. Yeah. I mean, I've, I haven't spent a lot of time really on the modern Tartaria for a while, but I did get very big into kind of the link between say, the 1300s to the Younger Dryas. So mm -hmm. how does it... There's a gap. There's a gap. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, a, a, there's very strong etymological links. Even the word Tartarian, I think, has so many clues in it. Um, and then also the other groups at the time, um, how Cro-Magnon Man fits in with this, with Tartaria as well with the giants um i got i got fascinated with giants for a long time everywhere we, we need to do a giants episode yeah. together now i can tell you something this has been unbelievable tom and hmm. casey uh i don't know what your thoughts are I, i'm mind blown i'm actually almost speechless <laughs> but i'm just sitting here thinking how does this correlate to australia we have to have megaliths in australia right they're just yeah. up, they're hidden they're under the ground they're tucked away there for sure yeah it's I th yeah i was thinking, thinking my imagination go wild i i yeah i kind of agree i think that um i'd like to do something i think i'd like to do something about what tartaria is you know and how i think it's formed so we can get a framework um and then i'd really like your opinion on that because I haven't actually really talked to anyone about it. So yeah. maybe yeah. we could just have like a more rather than a presentation kind of thing, just a chat about it. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. I am all in for that. Awesome. And then to Australia, because I do have some things that I'd actually like to go explore and have a little look. And um yeah, maybe we could chat about some of them. Unbelievable. That sounds okay, good. Well that's at least two more episodes with Tom. Oh, yes. Thanks, there will be, and be a lot more. You know? Oh my gosh, I'm sure there will be because this has just opened up so much more opportunity and so many other uh, topics and subjects that we haven't even really touched on. So, yeah, there's going to be definitely more episodes to come. And you know, Tom, you're not the first person I've heard that, to say that we are a civilization with amnesia. Um, Graham Hancock has his show on Netflix and he talks about how, you know, we can't have possibly have started it 6,000 years ago, human civilization. And, you know, you've just presented to us 
evidence that proves that we go so much further. And you, you even said um, 100,000 mm. years old, and I can't even make that compute in my brain. But, <laughs> but you know, it, it has to be. In Australia, of course, last nation discovered with unbelievable anomalies that are yet to be um we're, we've literally just scratched the surface you know and there's others that have been um doing a lot of the research and boots on the ground kind of like our mate gil gilbert dean he's he was amazing in his mm-hmm. time and his crew and sadly they are gone um yeah. and i would love to know anybody that has contacts um with gil or who knew gilbert because he knew of a a site that apparently had um, the skeletal remains of giants in Queensland and we need to figure out where that site is. So Mm -hmm. if that, if that knowledge is lost with him, I'm very sad, but we need to know if there's anybody else out there that that could possibly help us out because that would help us with our uh, giants episode. Perhaps any of the people that used to work with Gil on uh, Truth Hunter is Mm -hmm. publications, publications that he used to put out in the nineties. So, because that would be a very interesting site to find and check out, Tom. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. I I remember when I was young coming across a book that was on the uh, giants and the pygmies of Australia, mm-hmm. and I was telling someone about it a while ago, and I can't even remember how it came up, but I was I said no no no, there's definitely people here that are you know, were at least eight foot tall and maybe four foot tall. And it took, like, you can't find it on Google, but if you look hard enough, we found the pygmies. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there was even a the book that I was talking about. We found the book. Um, and in that book, they talk about them having to go into the, the jungle and there was three different types of people I think so modern um aboriginal people they split into two different groups and then the pygmies and then the giants and the Polynesians had the same stories that Mm -hmm. there was like multiple groups at different times in Australia um I'll see if I can dig it up see if I can find more on this Mm. but it's I mean there's so much out there sometimes it's hard to know even where to start I know I know it's just unbelievable Casey's got me I'm I'm going to find a a megalith site in Australia now (laughs) we we know that we know there has to be there's just yes there is for sure okay guys I think that's that's a wrap um anything else to add Casey not at this stage but I'm probably be lying in bed tonight trying to go to sleep with a thousand questions. So. Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, we could do a Q and A sometime as well. Oh, we totally should. But yeah. this was presentation was brilliant. That. It was. It was. I was actually thinking that when you were talking, I was like, it would be good to just get Tom, you know, on a live on a live, perhaps. Yes. Cool. Yeah. That would be so so awesome because people love that. We get all of our. Um, subscribers and anyone that's interested in ancient history and even modern history because it's all linked you know just they can get on and give us our questions and hopefully tom can give us the questions and give us the answers you know Mm -hmm. put you on the spot tom love to i like being put in the spot (laughs) (laughs) well thank you so much for joining us uh today kind of last minute we kind of said we think we have a time we can we can record and thank you we really appreciate you um putting this together for us it's been seriously an eye-opener and i i'm i'm looking at everything completely differently now and you know all it points to though is that there had to be a, a civilization of a larger stature number one and also with technology that is unfathomable to us you know something yes. that we don't even know um but it did exist um evidence with, of everywhere everywhere with the precision of the you know the lines and the cuts and and anyway we it's amazing thank you so much tom um casey what else do we need to add no i think that's it i think we just say thank you so much tom um and we're definitely going to get you back because I can already tell that people are going to love this. 
So. Agreed, agreed. So on that note, we hope you enjoyed today's episode with our uh, newest um, I guess we could call you a new team member, <laughs> a new, <laughs> a new. I, I'm not sure if that's a new right. Tartarian a new Tartarian truther. <laughs> um, and thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you next time. Cheers. See you guys. Bye. Bye.